So, Rebecca, you finally watched Love is Blind. I made it to a point that was so painful that I couldn't watch anymore, and then I had to turn it off. <laughs> what episode? It's the one where they're having the party at the lake house. Okay, that's pretty, that's, that's, that's going in there. So, what was the kicker? I was thinking about it. On the way up here, I think as someone that was tortured by their peers in middle school and high school, the way that the producers are setting everyone up to just be tortured in that scene of like all the exes and maybe the new, the exes that will return are all like drinking really heavily and like crushed together. Yeah. Something in my brain literally shorted out. So you're thinking like, come on, don't be cruel. Don't, don't send... Uh, Jeremy in in there. Don't yeah. don't send Jess in. Like who who which which which, which former who pers- made me the most comfortable? Was it, was it Trevor or was it, it was when the woman showed up? Who Sarah? Had, Sarah. Like my brain shorted out. I was just like, mm, cannot, cannot. Who are you having empathy for? Was it for Laura? Yeah, I love Laura. The way that she's so. Uh, she just tells it like it is. And then she's in that insane top that's like, I don't even know how it's like staying on her body. And I'm just thinking like, man, you got to manage that outfit. And now the girl that your fiance was with till 5 Uh a.m. is at this party. It was sheer torture. And then I had really bad reflux that night. And You think it caused it i think so i think it triggered something really really deep in me that was i mean did something happen in middle school Uh, so what i so it's funny that you said that so because in my reaction videos yeah with this season and previous seasons as well but this season in particular i frequently said the phrase this is kind of middle school right Mm -hmm. right now but anyway so did something happen to you i mean a lot of stuff happened but i have a (laughs) more than I want to talk about middle school trauma. I have a lot of questions about the show. Okay. Like, do they do this every season that they set up? They have these scenes yeah. where they... Okay. Well, not... I mean, every season doesn't have a situation like... I'm wondering... Well, maybe every season. In my memory, it's not always the case. But actually, as I review the seasons, it might happen every season where they have some sort of post-getaway get-together where they bring together both the couples that are still together and the love triangle third mm. individuals. And I have a contact who works on the show Ooh. and told me, because I, of course, you know, I'm always trying to figure out what's happening behind the scenes because it does yeah, kind of- I have a lot of questions. Because it does help because when you understand, then you understand the context of these humans and thus have more data as to what's driving their behavior. You also- if you understand the motivation of the showrunners and the editors, you can kind of see through the edit and get a better picture of the actual human behavior. Anyway, so one of the questions I asked her was, the way it looks is that they will send in people at particular strategic times. Because, you know, the way these parties always start, like at the lake, you have the main... It all se- It was like a horror movie. It all seems innocent and nice. <laughs> Until the the dun, dun, dun. until the uh, the ski doos show up or the jet skis show, up. but or you might not have even made it to the jet ski scene. Actually, at the end of that lake thing, I but, didn't. Okay, I can't wait for that. <laughs> well, nothing much happens exactly, but anyway, point is is that they will have all the main people. You know, your Jimmys and your Chelseas and your mm-hmm. Johnnies and your Amys, but then they will have people one at a time arrive and the way it kind of looks is that they just got there but of course it can't be that so i asked my contact what they did what she told me was she says yeah everyone arrives far earlier than that Mm -hmm. like you know they send in all the main cast and then in a van because you know these these locations aren't Netflix owned, right? right. They're, they're like a, an Airbnb that you rent or something or a resort kind of little thing. And then in a van. They Everyone's send in, in a van. All the second parties are in a van. Yeah. Together. Yeah. And they are, uh, the whole team, there's like hun- hundreds oh, of, yeah. of, of people monitoring all of the cameras <laughs> and the lapel mics, you know, off, yeah. off camera. And there's all these assistant producers who are, 
you know, frantically typing on their phone notes as because you know as we're watching the show, we can just passively watch it, but. They're trying to build a through but, line. Well, also, they're watching in real time. Imagine mm. you have 15 people that are all lapel mic'd individually, mm-hmm. by the way. and Drinking. It, and it's your job as an assistant uh, producer to sit there and listen to that one microphone mm-hmm. and keep track of everything that's happening, right? And you have to report up the chain, right? So then up the chain is someone that's, keeping track of like the summaries of all these things that are happening real time because the producers aren't hanging out next to the cast members mm-hmm. they're they're behind because they they try to create a scenario where they see as little of the production right. as possible yeah and you have to have camera guys right so that's mainly what they see but they don't see any of the other people anyway so then when the drama hasn't like they wait for a a slow moment, mm-hmm. you know, because usually there's drama just to begin with. And then they're like, okay, who should we send in next? And they send in the next person. And then once that drama kind of wraps up, they send in the next person. And here's the thing that just cracks me up is she told me that at the lake party, there were some like extraneous cast members that were never sent in because oh, there was so much drama without them. Right. So, so they're, they're just sitting in a van so, roasting and yeah. So there's like the, the, some sad like th- like third wheels just waiting for their oh moment in the sun, and the producers like, sorry, we had too much drama. We don't we don't need you. And they just I hope they're getting like fed out there or like bathroom breaks. <laughs> and, and I'm just trying to. And she said the way she worded it, it was more than one cast member that came wasn't let into the lake party. And I'm trying to think who that would have been. I mean, maybe Matthew, but I, somehow I doubt it was him. Anyway, so uh, so that's how they do it, yeah. But um, you haven't watched shows like this, maybe? No, so I'm, I'm getting introduced. This is just like Queer Love Ultimatum, where I'm getting introduced to the concept yeah. like so late. Yeah. So I have so many questions. So, one of the things I thought that was really interesting is that there's 15 folks of each, of male and female, not all of them hit. So, like, at at what point do you realize, I'm not going to get any dates out of this? Do you just get to say, I'm going home? Like, Yeah, well, you can, I think, go whenever you want. mm -hmm. They never tell us that, but I've talked to a lot of cast members who will fill in all the gaps and, you know, my contact on the show. But, yeah, people will just, by a certain point, they're there in the pods, I think, for 10 days. Mm -hmm. And the first day, you have 10 minutes minutes with each person. You have a little notebook. So, you spend 10 minutes. And then the second day, you're instructed to wear the same clothes. Mm. And you get to narrow it down to, like, what she said was 8 to 10. Typically, people will narrow it down to about 8 people or something. So you you're, you have it down to half. So if no one chooses you Oosh. for the second day, Ugh. then brutal. You just go home. <laughs> I think uh, that's. I mean, how torturous. But that's got to happen because you know some people are just kind. You know, clearly it's a numbers game. Well, also clearly there are some people that shine and some people that don't. Right. Right. Because when you're watching, there's people like Jimmy that apparently everyone starts to like gravitate towards mm-hmm. and there's probably others that liked him as well but just And does Jimmy have to agree to meet them again at some point? I don't yeah, of course, but I wonder if someone's not on their list like Jimmy's like these are my eight people and then someone's like well, Chelsea said she liked you too, so would you like oh. a date with her? Like I imagine there might be something like that mm-hmm. just to kind of give people a chance to know. Mm-hmm. But in terms of bell curves and whatnot, I would imagine by the second or especially, especially the third day, there'd be like a handful of people on either side that are that just don't get chosen by anybody. I don't know, though. I mean, talk about middle school nightmare. I know. You risk, I mean, you're so exposed, right? Your profile's on Netflix, website yeah and we never see from you again is there a second run version of this like do you get to is there like a 
like Love is Blind Rejects. Love is Blind Rejects. All Star- Love is Blind Rejects? <laughs> they haven't done that yet, but they do have another show called Perfect Match. Oh. Where they might show up. It's much more of like a typical reality TV show where mm-hmm. there's no pods, there's no experiment. It's just they throw in a bunch of singles. Because I thought, I mean, one of the things about the show is so brilliant is that they're all from the same town. Mm-hmm. So then the chances of them meeting up in the real world are so high, which only increases the drama. And then with social media, they can all find each other. Right. Yeah, they all have robust Instagram. Uh, because most of the recruiting, if not all, is through Instagram. Mm-hmm. Like the, the recruiters will just go through Instagram in a particular town and just DM them and say, would you like to be on a reality mm-hmm. TV show? Um, the exception to the local thing was Seattle because... They couldn't get enough Seattle people. <laughs> people are like, I'm not going into pods. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to go on a reality TV show. Mm-hmm. And I actually. So how far did they go? They went to Portland. Seattle? They went to Portland. Oh. Well, uh. Yeah. But, you know, Portland is as far from Seattle as like, I don't know, Charlotte is from New York. Or right. Something. I mean, it's three hours. You're not going to. I mean, in that part about like, well, we're all at the same bar and. I just stopped by to see the guys and, ooh, she was there. Who knew? You know, like, I thought that part was so interesting. I mean, that's not going to happen in Portland to Seattle. Yeah. But, uh, boy, the, the the drama got me. The whole being chosen, not chosen. So painful. So painful how? Oosh. I mean, who doesn't want to get chosen, right? And then why? So the one woman who had the kid. Jessica. Uh, Jessica. Like, did he not choose her because she had a child? You know, like, that dynamic is so interesting. And then... From from post-season interviews, mm-hmm. they will say, no, it was for Jimmy that Jessica, in that last... So, the way... I've broken this down, like, this is a Pruder film. <laughs> in that... Because I've watched it several times. And the way it looks to me is that I mean, there's a lot of sexism going on. Right, she's such a strong personality. Yeah. This season, can, I don't know again if there if it was around in other seasons, and I just didn't note it as much. There's or always like the way '80s body, like yeah. black body, is objectified by all these white, and yeah. I'm like, yeah, is this happening on national TV? Yeah, like this is crazy. And and AD talking about how she wants to follow Clay, uh-huh. and about how Jimmy says she he wants to 100 percent leave. And how Sarah Ann talks about how she's a patriot. Did you catch that? Yes. And like the anti-abortion shit. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if it was present in other seasons and mm-hmm. they just didn't show it, or if Charlotte is like another. I mean, it's, you is, know. is 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 from another time and place. It's far from Seattle. <laughs> but there were some. I was just like, what am? Are these America? Uh, of course they are. Anyway, patriot. I was just like, oh, I just wanted to. <laughs> oh my god. So. Let's talk about my favorite part. Yeah. Which is definitely the parents section. Okay. The parents talking about the realities of marriage. And and even Jimmy's sister was like, marriage is really, really hard. Because the whole show is like this build up to marriage as if women will like fall down on the floor crying to get married. Like it was just the intensity of the goal was uh, a lot for me. And then... Um, like an overemphasis. Yeah. Or yeah. like, you'll get married and like... Everything s- will be okay. Right. And then, so I felt like finally with the parents, we got this like, marriage is really, really hard. And, you know, are you ready for the actual realities of it? And I was so fascinated by Clay's trauma about his father's infidelity and that yeah. confession that he makes that he was on the trips that his dad took to be with his lovers and that he'd never watched the show before so he doesn't understand the premise Mm -hmm. so you've got ad who's like i'm ready to go i'm into this whole experience and he's like i'm super into you but i can't move at this pace and then she's like well i can't be with you then because i'm here for this experiment Mm -hmm. Uh, but i thought her mother ad's mother gives the most beautiful caring speech about her daughter um, I would say actually 80s mother speech is my favorite thing that happened because it was real and kind and mm-hmm. about 
loving someone so much that you just want what's best for them. Um, well, if you make it to the end, the dad, Clay's dad, mm. and Clay's mom have a conversation by themselves that is very interesting. Mm-hmm. So, if you can make uh, it to I'll the try. End. I'll try to jump back in. Can you give myself a little break? It was also weird. So, I did literally 18 hours of sex couples counseling training on zoom two days back to back and it's all of this stuff about healing conversations and nonviolent language and really listening to each other and really being there for each other and then to go from that into like two nights of trying well, to binge the show i was like I, wonder, I feel dirty like i think my stomach's gonna give out but i wonder if it helps you because when you are you know you and I would experience this as professors that you have these students that have all these wonderful uh, dreams and hopes for themselves when they become a therapist, Mm -hmm. you know, especially art therapy, right? Because in class you're going all over all these like interesting art interventions and you do it with each other and everyone's processing their feelings and every, you know, everyone's a perfect client kind of Mm -hmm. thing. Then they go to an agency and no one even wants to do art and therapy. Right. And the growth has yet to even begin for some of these people. Mm-hmm. Half the clients don't even want to talk to you. So when you come out of these trainings and you actually see actually how humans operate in the world, right. it might kind of give you a chance to infuse your learning into reality, right? So how much have you talked about Chelsea already? Well, so I've finished the whole season and okay. reacted a lot and talked a lot about Chelsea, but I'm not sure about how I want to talk about this right now. Cause, I, cause so, if I, if I tell you my thoughts, I would have to air your, this episode. So let's just like say a month from now, let's just say this. Okay. So that clip of her and her and Jimmy's second big fight has been the most parodied reality TV show moment that I've ever seen. I even sent you the one that I thought was the funniest. Um, Meaning that people will parody it on TikTok or Instagram or YouTube. They will. Yeah. I mean, and like Jimmy Fallon parodied it. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. That's funny. Yeah. The members of Roots, Questlove, and Black Thought. How did they do that? What did they? It's just them saying the lines and then Jimmy shows up. Which, which, uh, Which lines? Uh, when she's talking about, there was something that, so I think what really triggered people the most is where she, she says, you're going out too much. That's the third fight. That's the third, okay. Yeah. My bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the second fight was, you didn't kiss me today. Yes. What's the first fight? The first fight was after he was talking about AD being, oh, yes. being stacked. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the stacked fight, the kiss fight, and then the you fucked her fight. Uh, no, that the you fucked her fight is Laura. No, no, no. Oh, does he? Oh, right, right, right. You're right. You God, your, you're, you're good at this. You right. fucked your you friend. You fucked her once long ago. Yeah. Not that you fucked her that night. You just went out for drinks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we don't. So what were people parroting in that? That when she says, I don't want a husband that has friends, basically. Right is kind of the theme. I mean, it's kind of, I understand when TikTok or Instagram reels, people will parody this, you know, they'll, it's usually like one comedic person who will dress up as both and then they'll act out both and exaggerate it. Right. But for Fallon to do it, that's kind of dark actually, because what we're watching is not something to laugh about in Mm -hmm. my opinion. It's not something to, uh, it's real. Yeah, I mean, so I don't know if we want to talk about... The, I mean, I would be interested give, give, in... Give your, give your... So I really wanted to talk about... I was thinking a lot about the fear of abandonment. Mm-hmm. And every time I watch her, just her fear of... You know, I mean, she constantly says, I'm putting 100% into this. And I'm not getting anything back from you. You're not... And so that's such... You know, is it reality distortion or what? Is it, you know, what she's able to receive? And then the fight is so classic. He's saying, I'm giving you tons. I just gave it to you. And she's like, I didn't get it. (laughs) Uh, 
And so having just been through that couples therapy weekend, it was so interesting to think about that dynamic of when one couple, one person can't say, I'm so fucking terrified. And the other one's like, I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to you. Um, so I just, you know, that moment is so interesting. And, and I was so curious on your thoughts of why it's showing up in the zeitgeist so much. Like, what does it say about us that, um, you know, we want him, what's happening is she's kind of getting made fun of, mm -hmm. but I think there's something deeper there about, um, you know, do we get what we need from our partners? Um, and, and are there some needs that are so, are there some wounds that are, there are, <laughs> what are the wounds that are so deep that no matter what our partner does, it doesn't reach them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I often am asked this by journalists and I think about it a lot because of that really. <laughs> and normally I don't think about it that much, but I do wonder as to why Love is Blind or reality TV or these kinds of stories are in the zeitgeist or are interesting to people. They provoke people because for me, a lot of this stuff is as a couple therapist myself, it's just stuff that I see all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not new. It's like asking, I don't know, a scuba diver about, you know, you're watching a show about a, an octopus or a fish or something. And you're just like, Whoa, fish exist. You're a scuba <laughs> diver's like, yeah, well, that's every day of my life. Fish exist. But I do think that it's a number of things. One is, is that when, we watch these shows, it's an, it's an opportunity for us to see what is at least being shown to us as quote unquote reality. I will say that the Chelsea and Jimmy stuff, I, I would bet my life that that stuff is absolutely real. It, I mean, you can, I, I felt like I could see it in her eyes, the sheer terror. Yeah. The way they're interacting is quintessential. And the times where I've seen people try to act or drum this up, it never even comes close to what mm -hmm. I see in my office, and that's what I see in my office. Yeah. And and I see the individual version of that, which right. is like, I'm getting left once again. And I, as a therapist, I'm saying like, well, let's step back and look at like, I, I from what the story I just heard, I don't experience that you're getting left. Why do you feel like you're getting left? Right. So I think it's that it's an opportunity to finally see what people are going through because the fights or the interpersonal conflict that you see in movies or TV, it's never as close. It's not even close to reality, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's always a, a shortcut that writers will take. So I think it's compelling because of that. I think it also provides clearly as I think what motivates a lot of the parroting, which is all of us have tremendous shame about ourselves, our insecurities. It's one of the most shameful things you can be as a person in our society is clingy mm -hmm. and demanding, nagging, uh, insecure, immature, overreactive, victim mentality, quote unquote. All of us have that <laughs> and, are, and are that, but we hate ourselves for being human. Mm -hmm. And when we are given an opportunity to see it outside of ourselves, we will project onto those figures and will proceed to hate them and to ridicule them. Also, you know, there's a lot of pain in the world and these shows provide a, a target that, because, uh, Clearly, we have a phenomenon in our society, whether it's on the playground or on the internet, that we have a desire to not just attack somebody, but to attack with a crowd mm -hmm. somebody. It's the stoning of the sex worker in the streets, right? Mm -hmm. It's one thing to feel like, oh, I hate that person, but it's an entire other thing where it's like, we hate this person. Mm -hmm. We are right and the energy that builds around a, a figure that a we has decided is the enemy, is ridiculable. Mm -hmm. Someone that's safe to attack, someone that is 
has been socially identified as a target of that hatred is a very compelling social force and reality TV hands that on a platter Mm -hmm. and Chelsea fits all the markers. Right. I mean, you know, Chelsea, I think is, I mean, I, so one of the main things I do with individual clients who are in partnerships, who are not getting what they want is, you know, that Venn diagram where I'm like, if you're lucky, your client will give you 40%, your client, (laughs) your partner will give you 40% of what you need. Don't all of us therapists (laughs) see our partners as clients? (laughs) Pretty much. Um, And how are you going to meet that other 60% of your life outside of your partner? And I think that piece that Chelsea is saying of my partner will give me everything. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be whole, right? It's like this fantasy I mean, if you, you know, it's, this is like psychoanalytic, like, Mm -hmm. you know, merging with them. If I could just merge back with the mother, Mm -hmm. everything would be okay. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we can't, we have to live these kind of separate lives in connection to other people, which is so torturous. But if you've never had enough of mother to begin with, Mm -hmm. and you're in a constant state since you were the age of 18 months of grasping and mm-hmm. feeling abandoned, then you're going to see what you're going to see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think her, and, you know, she cries a lot in the pods, right? I mean, like, we get this sense that she's very, very emotional, even before we see her kind of interacting in real life. Mm-hmm. Um so, Did you think, Jimmy, let's take a break. I, I okay. want to ask you a bunch of individual questions. Okay. Like, Let's do an OPP, Rebecca. These people became patrons all the way back in 2021. That's amazing. These are all regular sorts of patrons, and I organize these folks. They all live in the States. So we have B or Bia from Beaverton, Oregon. Yes. Good old Beaverton. Celia from, uh, or Celia from Capo Beach, California. Bianca from Bothell. Did you know on the, uh, I listened to a podcast called TBTL and they always talk about how there's this sign that as you head into Bothell that says, come for a day, stay for a lifetime. <laughs> what does that evoke in you when you hear that? I mean, when I think of Bothell, I think of like top of the lake, Yeah, which I learned is funny as a funny euphemism that we only use here in Seattle because I said to somebody, bottom of the lake, meaning Renton. Yeah. And they were like, bottom of the lake, like oh, right. bottom. And I was like, no, like the lake, yeah. there's a top of the lake and there's a bottom of the lake. Yeah, yeah. So I I stay for a lifetime. I, I mean, I think Yelm has, not Yelm. Is it Yelm? Uh, y- no, is it Wenatchee or Yakima? Is it Yakima is the uh, Palm Springs of Washington State. Oh, right. I, I, they, I mean, you can't top that. That's yeah, yeah. like... <laughs> But probably if you went to Bothell, you would stay for a lifetime. It's very nice. Yeah. No, yeah, it's it's, it's really it's nice. Convenient. Yeah. Top of the lake. Yeah. Not bottom of the lake. It's a cute little neighborhood. Jessica from Lakewood, Colorado. Kim from Downers Grove, Illinois. Zoe from Layton, Utah. Rosa from Loma Linda, California. Linda, that's like cute or pretty, right? So it must be pretty Loma. I wonder what Loma is. Victoria from Denton, Texas. Marnie from Colorado Springs, Colorado. A famous art therapy program is there. Uh, my mom's parents lived there temporarily before she was born. Hmm. Doodle Brothers from Boise, Idaho. <laughs> Boise, Idaho, which is now like as expensive as Seattle. It went from being that. the cutest little town to like... It just exploded in the pandemic, and now no one can afford to live there, just like here. Yeah, so I was so confused. I heard about all these like Silicon Valley people moving. It, is it Boise or Boise? I don't know. I say Boise, but it's because it's like an outdoor fantastico. Like you leave yeah. your house and you're like in the most grand high desert hiking. If you're sporty, but it's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, but it's a cute town. There's great arts programming there. I think there's a college there. The food's really good. And then it just got... The food's really good? Yes. Let's have a field trip. I've been there and... It's I an mean, eight-hour drive from Seattle, Washington. Uh, we can do it in a day. Yeah, I, and that's 
why I know it because I would stop there reluctantly on my way to like Arches or the Grand Canyon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, and half, it's halfway. So maybe I need to revisit. and. Yeah, we should podcast from Boise. I'm in. Uh, James from Seattle, Washington. I know that place. Emily from Seattle. Margaret so, from Boulder. Uh, so I just want to say Seattle is an hour away from Seattle. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, we both live in Seattle and it takes you like 40 minutes to get here. Um Margaret from Boulder. I always think of Mork from Mork. Boulder, maybe that's where the art therapy program is, not in Colorado Springs. Oh, okay. Brittany from Portland, Oregon. We love it. Salma from Baltimore, Maryland. Eva. We love it. Eva from La Mesa, California. Mm-hmm. Anna Mesa, Luisa. Meaning the plateau. The Mesa, yeah. Uh, Anna Luisa from Broomfield, Colorado. A lot of Colorado. Another Idaho person, Hannah from Pocatello. I like that's a nice little name, Pocatello. Val from Boston, Mass. KB from West Palm Beach, Florida. Hmm. Nilu, Nilo or Nilu from Laramie, Wyoming. Famous Laramie, Wyoming. Yeah, Laramie is Laramie famous Project. for a murder. Yeah, it's where Matthew Shepard was murdered. Right. But there's another murder there. There's a podcast that I listened to about another murder, I think, that happened. Anyway, Matthew from Salt Lake City and Trisha from New York, New York. Thank you so much for becoming a patron and staying a patron through Think It Thin. And I like doing OPP with Rebecca because she has the most interesting things to say than uh, that uh, you know, no one f- else. I never know what to say and all the other people don't know what to say either, well, you know, but you f- actually have things to say. My first job out of college, I worked for AAA. Oh, that's right. So, you know, and you know, I like to think about this great nation and all of its places. I have a lot. To, and then when do I not have anything to say? I always have something to say, but uh, you had interesting things. To say. <laughs> so, do you think Jimmy chose wrong in choosing mm. Chelsea over Jessica? I mean, who... Okay. If it were me, if I was Jimmy, I would have chosen Jessica because for me, Chelsea was so emotional in the pods that that would just be a red flag for me. Like, it's just... What do you mean by emotional? She would just... I mean, you know, who knows what really happened in their long conversations, but she's often crying in their cuts and the pods. And I was like, whoa, that's a lot for me. Like, what? what is so intense already? And then you see later maybe mm-hmm. what could have been going on. Yeah. So... You want someone that's I need low maintenance. S- I need a steady Eddie. Yeah. Do you think Jimmy, given Jimmy's personality, mm-hmm. he chose wrong? Well, I think, you know, you see from, I loved his parents so much. Yeah. I just wanted to squeeze them. Yeah. But the way the dad was like, you know, I took your mother at her faults. I knew what her faults were right away. She was a hoarder. Yeah. And I took her anyways. And so I think that's interesting modeling if you've had that as a kid. Like, we can handle faults. We can make it through. Um you know, emotional lability, like labileness. Yeah, li- lability is um, a lot for me. I'm fine with emotion, but I just that just her behavior in the pods. I was like, hmm, this is a lot. And there was a way that you can just feel how grounded Jessica is, and you know, she's been a single parent. Yeah. I mean, and everybody's trauma history was so intense. Are yeah. their trauma histories always that intense on the? Well, uh, not usually highlighted, but sometimes it is, and I very much appreciate that because they, according to my, you know, my contact, they have like hours and hours and hours of pod footage because mm-hmm. when they start narrowing it down, day three or four, they'll spend the entire day with one person, mm-hmm. like twelve hours, just. Because there's nothing else to do. Because Right. I also thought it was interesting that the men get a pool table and the women do not. <laughs> I was like, why don't the women get a pool table? What's in the... What was in the... And there's like nothing in the women's room except for like food and boots. Like, is it this expectation that they're just supposed to constantly socialize? And we know... And we like... With the way that men are socialized in our culture, men get a pool table. Yeah, women yeah. just have to like, you know, gossip with each other all or day. Or there's like knitting equipment or something. I don't know. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I mean, dear listener, if you can spot the activities that are available to the women in the women's lounge, please let us know. I, I seem to remember there was like a yoga area, or, oh. or like a like a exercise mm-hmm. little zone or something. Yeah, I mean, just the detox they must experience of not having access to their phones. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I think I've told you I regularly. I still have the screen report hours because when Eli was little, and it regularly says. I mean, I'm running my whole business through my phone, but it's you know like you spent eight hours, you spent nine hours. Like I'm just trying to imagine. nine hours looking at your phone because you couldn't because your phone could be on like podcast right. or if you're driving and you're using the yeah the you know the, the app to drive yeah because it's different. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like there's like doom scrolling, and then there's right. I don't think I'm spending. There's no way I could spend nine hours doom scrolling. Right. I'm, I'm working too goddamn much. Um, but, anyways, I was just trying to imagine. Like, yeah, they don't get their phones at the getaway either. Yeah. So it's like, and you really see that with that one couple with the 25 year old principal whose name I'm Kenneth. Like, Kenneth. Kenneth and Brittany. Yeah. I mean, you really see it with Kenneth. His yeah. personality shift when he gets his phone back and the way the relationship falls apart. Yeah. There was a lot of dudes inappropriately on phones this season. Mm. What do you think of Matthew? Tell me what you thought of Matthew. Uh, and Matthew was the America is watching guy in the pods. Yeah. So can I just say what I thought? And even if I Please. get in trouble. Okay. So I thought Matthew exhibited... Neuro spicy on the spectrum. Yeah. So let me just give us an asterisk before you, because I'm not going to say anything more other than this, that when I first saw him, I might have even said in a reaction video, I bet you anything people are going to think that he's on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I will say right now that I'm not a fan of that kind of of knee jerk labeling that happens because it happens so often, especially Mm -hmm. on reality TV. However, I will say I started to, as time went on, think more and more. Possibly, I mean, I'm, I, I can't know. I'd right. have to, but there's and some... I talked with people on the spectrum mm-hmm. who are in that zone, and w- mm-hmm. and they would agree that he has some hallmarks. So there's some key factors that led me to this <laughs> deeply clinical decision. One was the way that he can't connect with most people. And then when he does connect, it's really, really deep with just a few people. But then he has a pat, you learn that he has a pat speech that he's given to these two women verbatim, and it felt really real to both of them. Um, And then you see in the men's lounge, he cannot relate to anyone. He's reading a book, like, you know, I mean, he's just retreated so intensely. Mm-hmm. But it was the both speech to both women, like verbatim. I was like, that's something most people can't do. Why do people on the spectrum do that? Well, they are really good at talking about certain things. So that might be the thing that he's really good at talking about. So that could be why it played out the way he did with Matthew, with both Amber and AD. Because the way that it looked from the outside was that he's, what, like a psychopathic con artist that is trying to trick two women? Because that's the way it was being interpreted. Yeah. And I think if... Which still can be true, because you, you, right. you can have and con gonna, artist people on the spectrum, by the way. It's not like people on the spectrum right. are all angels. You know? I'm thinking about something that happened to me decades ago when two people got really offended that I both gave them art from the same series that I had been creating. And like, they didn't understand that like, as an artist, you make art in series. And so things look, wait, tell, tell the, tell the story. (sighs) I'm going to get so pissed off at these people. (laughs) I'm already, I'm already livid. I don't even know the story. I'm already livid at them. So when you're an artist, you often make art in series. Yeah. Like, uh, like Van Gogh and his sunflowers. Right. So you're playing with the same colors, the same concepts. It's on your mind. You're in a groove and you just go with it. Yeah. You have a similar thing that all artists, Jackson Pollock, mm-hmm. that you have this form that you do with watercolors mm-hmm. and you... Because it was yeah. with printmaking, which is even more about working in series okay. than even other art forms. But it, but seeing your posts and your art, it's 
which you, you still you know owe me, me, which you still owe me. By I the know way. I should bring you one. That and it's it's you know on your yeah. tarot cards that you can tell it, it's mine. But it's always impressive to me that you can iterate infinitely, oh, and they're all concept. but they're all different and they have different right. moods. And every every, you, every one has a different feeling, you know. Right, That's and, amazing. If, and it's a mashup of Anna Mendiata, um, Mark Chagall. Uh, Frida Kahlo, right? Like I'm playing with these forms over and over again. So these two people that were both ready to let go of me in their life, I had gotten the opportunity to play with a friend's printing press, which is a big deal because those suckers are expensive and big. And, you know, it was nice that this guy a couple times let me kind of play around in it. And I gave them away as gifts because at the time I was like, you know, like living underneath the poverty line and so just to get about the technology is this like a wood carving or no this is plate work so you have a massive rolling printing press and you put colors and shapes down on a plate you put the paper on top of it and how do you make those shapes you can cut them on a paper and like put ink on those ones or take them off um, you're really playing with shape and form on like a flat surface, but it can start to look really three dimensional because I'm 50% comprehending, but, but anyway, go on. Anyways, I gave two of the art pieces that looked very similar to two people I was very close to. And when they found out, they got really upset that they had both, you know, it felt like, what did they say? I don't know. And I was like, dude, this is art. Like, this is how art works and this is all i have to give um it yeah. felt impersonal it felt impersonal and, and, it felt and like, like like you were tricking them like yeah. well like so, like like here i made this beautiful piece of art and it's their assumption was it's only for you and there's only one of them those are all things that i didn't say well i could imagine having a split second thought when you found out that a similar piece was given to someone else that wait is she giving this out like willy nilly mm-hmm. and just handing them out to thousands of people? And she made me feel like this was a special thing because the second thought I'd have was, well, she might just consider this other person special too. <laughs> you know, she, it's possible that she literally only gave two of these to anybody. Right. Right. I mean, I think I had 10 to give away. Yeah. And it was also, you know, for me, it was like this once in a lifetime experience that I had like access to a press, like, mm-hmm. I mean, you have to be in school or take a class. It's not something like, I mean, my watercolors, I can like travel with them and just. How upset were they? Very upset. I think it was one of the things that led to my f- connection with both of those people ending. But, I mean, it must have been. A symptom. A symptom. But at the time I was like, you know, sometimes I can really admit when I've done wrong, but at this time I was like, come on people. Like, yeah. um. Yeah, but so, you know, we all want to feel, but this gets back to the theme of specialness and not feeling special and how um, folks on the spectrum really, you know, mask uh, to do a really, you know, I mean, Matthew was clearly struggling so hard. And my curiosity is if he gave the speech once and it went so well that he was like, oh, I'll just do this again. Mm Mm-hmm. Not knowing, not even a mat. I mean, he's not talking to anybody, mm-hmm. so he can't even imagine the women's bunk with no pool table, where all they have to do is kind of compare notes and chat with each other. Yeah. The other thing is, um, well, anyway. So, so that's Matthew. Let's take a break. I want to ask you about uh, Laura and Jeremy and Sarah. Mm. What do you say? <laughs> So, what did you think about Sarah having mm. DM'd Jeremy right out of the getaways? I mean, I'm not surprised if you really like someone, if you want to let them know they're still in your thoughts. I mean, you know that he's getting his phone back for the first time, and maybe she didn't like Jessica. Is that her name? No. Uh, uh, Laura. Maybe she didn't like Laura. And was hoping, you know, that they'd had a bad getaway and she could swoop in. A lot of people are saying, including AD at the lake party, that that's a shitty thing to do. Mm -hmm. So you think, well. I mean, for me, it's, 
I can't take a lot of these connections seriously. Is that bad? No, from the outside. Yes. But I always have to remind myself, for these people, it's like living... This is all they've done for weeks. Yeah. The intensity is mm-hmm. so rapid, right? Mm-hmm. For us, you're like, you just met all these people two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. So who cares? But for these people, it's... it's all they've been doing. Yeah, you know, like when you go to camp, that's mm-hmm. just overnight. You, right. These people are your best friends. Imagine going to camp for two weeks. Yeah. And, and the idea is you get married to right. one At of the, the people. At the end of camp. Ugh, God. Yeah. <laughs> horrible camp. Um. But anyway, okay, so... Um, but also, I don't live in straight monogamous culture. Uh-huh. Oh, really? I thought I thought that's... <laughs> wait, what? So, I think... I mean, that was fascinating, too. Like, a lot of the intensity around, like, marriage means everything to me. There were a lot of dynamics for me. And I haven't, like, been in straight girl... What is that? Kind of gossipy world i haven't been in that world since i was 17 years old Mm -hmm. so i think that there is a way in which there were tons of social dynamic rules that i haven't participated in in so long obviously i don't want anyone to hurt anybody i don't want anything to happen outside of contracts but i could imagine jessica Am I saying that right? I need a list of who. Laura and Jeremy were engaged. Right. And, and who Sarah is wanted Sarah? To, wanted to get with. I could imagine them. that Sarah is hoping to get in. She, and it says, I really, really like you. And the fact that they met up at whatever time and they talked till five in the morning says that she really, really liked him. Yeah. It's interesting. And she's willing. Who knows what her life looks like, but like, I know I can't stay up for f- till 5 a.m. for anyone. I can't stay up till past 10 p.m. Oh. So, like, she's wrecked. She's she's playing with fire, I'm sure, in lots of ways. I have to force myself to go to bed at 3 in the morning. Really? Uh, I, if I did force, I, I'm such a night owl. Like, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. My whole family is this way. Um, my sister will get on the phone with me. She has a daycare that she has to start work at like 5 or 4.30 in the morning to prepare for the kids to come over mm-hmm. because the kids are coming before the parents go to work, mm-hmm. you know? And I'll be on the phone with, she, and she lives in Minnesota two hours mm-hmm. ahead. So I'll be on the phone with her and it'll be like one in the morning. And I'm like, Colleen, it's, it's three in the morning. It's a Wednesday night. She's like, oh, it's fine. And I'm just like, oh my God. Um, but anyway, so with... Yeah, if uh, I don't get nine hours of sleep, I'm a complete mess. I need my sleep too, for sure. It's just everything gets shifted forward. But I made an exception for you this morning, though. That's I feel so honored. <laughs> I still went to bed at three thirty, though. That's insane. Um, so for Sarah. you to say this, it's really interesting because, yeah, when I watch it as a het person myself that lives in a, I don't know if I would say I live in a het world, but. Um, Pretty it's hard heady. not to live in a head, head world yeah. when you're heterosexual. But I've always thought this, too, because every season there's this notion of, like, boys against girls. Mm. And if you betray the in-group of the girls or the boys, particularly the girls that I see mm-hmm. on this show, then you will be attacked. Mm-hmm. There's this very angry response from the crowd, from the audience, and also from the women on the show. And and also on the flip side of the coin is if someone in your in-group does something bad, it doesn't matter. You still stick up for them. Mm-hmm. And we've seen that in previous seasons. Not always, but it, the opinions of was she wrong or was he wrong mm-hmm. will be split right down the middle regarding uh, uh, gender on the show. And in my world, that's not how I think. That's not how I live. I don't, if a guy friend of mine, if anything, if a guy friend of mine is a dick to his wife, I'm harder on him than I would ever be on her Mm -hmm. because I can bro down with him and be like, dude, what the fuck is wrong with you? (laughs) You know, and like punch him in the shoulder and be like, knock it off. That's sexist. And I've done that before. Mm -hmm. Whereas if one of my women friends were to be sexist, I I don't know if I I would be as strong. You confront me on my sexism all the time, or my 
my gender biases all the I try time, not so. to, but I, it just flies out of me. And then it's I'm good. like, well. No, it's good. You know. Um, so I, yeah. So I guess I consider you an honorary bro. <laughs> You're an honorary bro. Oh, this is the greatest day of my life. <laughs> I'm going to get punched in the shoulder. I just know it. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I, so I think what sarah did was she broke the the girl code the the original sin of the girl code by and was she in the in group i think you are until you're not like it's assumed that you are Mm -hmm. even though when you get to the reunion it's not quite as all lovey-dovey even Mm -hmm. in the pods as i think that they hope it to be anyway another question do you love Amy and Johnny as much as the world does? Mm. There's some serious issues there. <laughs> Johnny's fears around having children before he's financially stable. He grew up in severe poverty. He talked about that. Yeah, but man, that is that's a lot to put on a partner. Where she's like, what if we accidentally get pregnant? And he's just like, oh, I can't handle it. Yeah. Um, so th- that's the one that really sticks to me. She appears to be the nicest person on the planet and should just get the greatest partner in the world. That scene with her dad, I think I teared up. Where he was like, I just, you know, he Johnny asked for her hand and he gets all flustered and eventually says yes. Like... It's clear her family loves her. Johnny loves her. That scene where AD walks up to them is like, I don't know what the two of you have, but like, I want more of it. I mean, there are just couples like that, you know, where you feel that off of them. And I would say most couples in the world that last beyond a few months mm-hmm. have that thing mm-hmm. that Amy and Johnny have where they're lovey do- I mean, more maybe some fights are sprinkled in there but the chemistry right like at the lake party you see jimmy and chelsea (laughs) that are just like not really connecting Mm -hmm. you see ad and clay Mm -hmm. you wouldn't even know they were a couple right he's late she's like oh he's working right you can feel the tensions there but amy and johnny it's like obviously they're a new couple Mm -hmm. I i i find them to be fairly typical in that way i mean not all couples are like that but you know when you fall in love it's compelling yeah and it's really nice to see and it's very interesting i mean they they're not having vaginal penis penetrative sex but they're clearly doing stuff (laughs) they're clearly (laughs) building intimacy yeah and in certain circles fifth base Mm. anal is not considered Mm-hmm. Uh, off, off the. You know, a, we as, don't want to make any. I don't know. Maybe you've heard back channels. No, no, no. Literally, <laughs> but a bum. Uh, I heard our our, our no, banter. I'm saying nothing about I've them. I've heard our banter in the last podcast about uh, sexual innuendos was people's favorite. So <laughs> I'll be sure to bring it that in whenever I can. Um, yeah, I mean, there is a tenderness and a sweetness. You know, don't we all? I don't know. Maybe there's some people who don't want it, but. You know, who doesn't want someone that looks at you with adoration? I'm thinking about one of some of my favorite couples. And, you know, when you're with them, I feel more grounded because they're so connected to each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess that's more than like this kind of marriage quest that this show presents. Like, you know, we're all desperate for connection. Mm -hmm. We're wired for connection. Mm Mm-hmm. We're also wired like Chelsea to panic, like all hell. But, you know, in the end, don't we all just want to be loved? Yeah. And someone to look at you that says, you're, you're great. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to give you a, a three-point scale okay. with three meaning three. That, that you liked or loved them. Okay. Two meaning whatever, Meh. and one meaning you disliked or even hated them. Well, let's do one through five. So five is love, three or yeah. four is like. Okay. Okay. Chelsea. Chelsea. Oh, Chelsea hurts my heart. It's right in the middle. Uh, she, uh, breaks, three. she breaks my heart so much. Jimmy. I love Jimmy, but I think if Jimmy and I met in person, there would probably, it would not go well. But, but based on the show. Based on the show, he's very entertaining. Okay. Good TV, Jimmy. Bravo. Uh, 
but if you met him, you think you wouldn't like to hang out. I mean, out. Don't, can you see me and Jimmy hanging out? I if, can, actually. Okay, all right. I can. I definitely want to hang out with Jimmy's parents. If they want to hang out with a nice Jewish lesbian, I want to hang out with Jimmy's parents. I can see Jimmy being okay with that. I think there's some good pulled pork soaked I mean, the, the, the deception of... I definitely want to go shopping with Jimmy's mother because she sounds <laughs> like she just buys anything that she wants. And I like that. A woman. Yeah. Um, yeah. Don't you hoard like clothes kind of? Yeah. I am in my process of creating my spring consignment bags. Yeah. And it's twice a year. I say I have a problem, but then I also, my hobby is moving clothes around the planet and that just has to be okay. Yeah. You're part of the, <laughs> economic circle of life yes <laughs> you're giving jobs that's what i say to myself when i go to a casino it's like well i, I I'm, I'm i'm spreading the love ad five five seven i love her clay <sighs> clay i feel for you i think clay for me is every client at the beginning of therapy which is my parents are so messed up and i am a ticking time bomb waiting to turn into my parents do you think there's a kernel of goodness oh yes that you could see yeah i also know star athletes you know that person he was cuddled and told he was the best and you know immigrant parents who have a star child i mean i can just see this whole dynamic mm -hmm. uh so i really feel for him mm -hmm. and he feels like he has to fucking hustle which i also can relate to and that makes you crazy were his parents immigrants his dad is from Ghana, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, Laura. I love Laura. Five. She's okay. so sassy. A lot of people hated Laura. I'm looking at my survey. Not that you have to conform, because I, I often will disagree in ways. But and if she Laura could is one of the most me... hated people oh, really? on the show. Yeah. Wow. If she could teach me how to wear that top that she wears at the boathouse, like... I have a lot of fashion. Her hair is also on point when they were on the vacation and she's got like eight rubber bands in there. I have a lot to learn from Laura. People will say that Laura is mean, hostile. Laura's people are from Chicago. Laura is very familiar to me. She has some Eastern European heritage. I, I know Laura. I will say that my contact on the show said that Laura had a lot of scenes with Jeremy that were pleasant and loving mm -hmm. and nice that were cut out because what my contact believes, because my contact doesn't work on the editing team, that... Who is this contact? I, I can't say. I know, it's so exciting. But she we says... We share so much and you have these secrets from me. It's overwhelming. Well, it, it helps because... You're it, like, what the hell is... This thing is so... This is like a juggernaut. Because I'm always trying to figure out what actually happened. <laughs> what is going because on Because if here? I'm going to talk Help about... me. If I'm going to talk about personality and relationships, I have to know more data than right. what is being shown to us. But yes. what she's saying is that... You Laura know, cause, is cause painted they, they, to be the... Well, not... not maybe. I mean, that maybe some people would say that, but I think more in a neutral way that, you know, they shoot the entire season and then they get all the footage in the editing bay and then they edit it. And so they already knew by the time they were editing that Laura and Jeremy uh, made it barely past the getaway. Mm -hmm. So their strategy, I think, is if a couple isn't needed to be mm. rooted for among the audience, then the we don't have to waste time mm -hmm. in the show because they clearly are very economical about what they show mm -hmm. and what they don't, you know, because a different reality TV show would stress this out to be 30 episodes because mm -hmm. there's so much to get into, but they are dedicated to truncating this how, fu how fucker that? into 12 <laughs> episodes. So anyway, that that's one. Jeremy. Jeremy, you're a one. I don't, I- just, Why do you hate Jeremy? I hate Jeremy because he was out till 5 a.m. with another woman. That would just, you know me. I like consistency. Mm -hmm. So don't fucking lie to me. I have zero patience. Mm. Also, just the way he talked to Laura the next day. Yeah, with his sunglasses on, like nothing to see here. I'm like, dude, it's fucking written all over your fucking face. And your mother just called you out. So. And then he, uh, uh, at the lake party, says, she's trying to make me out to be the bad guy. Right. 
I mean, having raised a young person who is now dating, if it came back to me that my kiddo had done something similar, I would give them a strong talking to. Like, that's just... It's funny, like, where is your line in the sand? And being kind and respectful to your partners, to me, is a really big deal. Yeah. Brittany. Brittany and Kenneth. <sighs> Brittany's right in the middle. For, uh, Brittany's a meh for me. Ken- Three. What about Kenneth? I have a lot of questions about Kenneth. How can you be 25 and be a school principal? I know. Like, Well, apparently it's like a small private school. Oh, Okay. But even still, that level of responsibility. So the way that they carry themselves, the weight of the world is on that man's shoulders. Yeah. So he's a five for me. I mean, I just want him. I mean, here is a some here is someone who is on the run fr- from something. If you are twenty five, and you are a school principal, what are you avoiding? Because. <laughs> You're 25. Like, you should be making mistakes, causing a little bit of trouble. You know, he is so respectful and kind to her. You know, you get a real sense of who he is. But something's going on that he cannot kind of let go. And you see that on the boat. Like, they're they're on the boat. It's beautiful. He's telling about this really fun time that he had with a dolphin but like he can't have that with her in the moment, right? Like they're when they're in the pods, they're he's able to like bear his soul and connect. But you see the slow progression as he gets out into the real world that he's just uh, there's something super heavy in that man's heart. Uh, I see a three of swords. I see the three of swords cards in my mind of like this is someone who's been pierced many many times by life and has their guards up for a reason. What about Trevor? Remember him, the mullet guy? I love Trevor. Uh, if you, you know, in New York, there are a thousand. Trevor is a, a common character. Mm. Uh, I wonder how you'll feel if you watch the rest. Okay. But most people at that phase, because I surveyed my listeners mm-hmm. mid season, and Trevor was one of the most loved characters. Yeah. And then he falls from grace? Well, you'll have to make okay. your own decision. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he definitely, I don't know if his people are from New York City, but he reads like a New York City man. Mm. Like, bigger than life, big, big heart, just wants everyone to feel good. Um, I enjoyed him. So, who's left? Uh, well, I didn't ask you about Sarah or. I, I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, already, I already knew what you were going to say. And then there's Amber, which we barely met. Yeah. Um, and then I want to give Jessica like 500 stars. Okay. For being a single mom and having the best hair I have ever seen. I don't know what it takes to get that hair to that level, but my goodness, sister, that's some amazing hair. Jessica's hair? Yeah. I can't even picture it. It's funny. Stacy and I were out last night and the waitress left the table and Stacy said, oh, her hair, it was just so full and thick and really great and i had just seen the waitress a second and a half earlier and i couldn't picture her hair for the life of me and right now i cannot picture jessica's hair but anyway um who would you date who would i date oh there's and then there's also who would date me there's also Mac- <laughs> well who would you date but there's also Mackenzie, who was the pee in the pool girl but so oh probably not date Mackenzie. i mean i i who would i date I mean, Jessica and I would probably have a really good time. We have similar mm. trauma background. Both have kids. Yeah, her trauma was like... Ballistic. Yeah. Yeah. But like, I think we'd probably, you know, funny, sassy. What do you think about Jessica's, he's going to need his EpiPen? EpiPen. I mean, she's saying I'm a catch, which is, you she's know... She's saying she's hot is what she's saying. She's saying that she is a... But then she also says in that same moment, I was kind of blustering because I'm the one that's falling apart right now. So I think she knows that like she builds herself up and then kind of crumbles. But I mean, I say that about myself too. Like, But there's something particularly 
enraging to the public when a woman I know says that she's hot. Well, and you know, this is funny story about me. I'm back in touch with somebody that I went to grad school with. And the very first day of grad school, I walked into the wrong class. And my friend will bring up this story from time to time that I, I walked into the class. I was informed that I was in the wrong class. I laughed it off. I was totally confident. And I walked into the right class. And she will say, like, she was so triggered in that moment that, like, I didn't apologize. I wasn't meek. I didn't, like, fall on my sword that I'd done something totally horrible. It's a female mandate. Like, yeah. if you don't act your station, right. then you're a stuck-up bitch. Yeah. And I get in trouble for this all the time. Yeah. I was thinking about times. That nasty woman. Well, and just, like, being. Who persisted. In the- Right. It, being in the mother world of like all of the times that you're supposed to be kind of meek and on the PTA or like that time that I sat on a board of a professional organization and I was not meek. You know, I mean, I I do not present as typically female. It gets me in trouble all the time and I can't stop doing it because yeah. I don't believe in it and it's never gotten me anything. And when I have to listen to women apologize over and over again for things they shouldn't be apologizing for i sometimes i have to leave the room because i'm just like "Mm." yeah yeah it would drive me nuts i i'm sorry to say this but i'm glad i'm a dude it's hella easier i wish i could be a dude sometimes i get rewarded for being a confident yeah (laughs) i mean can you think about me so let's play this game imagine me meek and apologizing all the time and being deferential to you. Yeah. Would you have invited me on this show? No. So here I am, the only female co host, because I code as male and a lot, of, I can stand toe to toe with you. And I, <laughs> we get in the arguments, you confront me, I confront you. Yeah. Like, well, it it's is- not just that aspect of your female, anti femaleness, you know. The decision of who is my co-host is literally just like who who are my friends that would, would be willing to do this. Um, but but like there is a banter that we have yeah. that, and it's a nice. Uh, I was actually telling Stacy about this. Like Berto talks too much, <laughs> Bob never talks at all, and you talk just right, and you so- also will interrupt just right. Mm. Like, you and I probably have the most conversational style right. for that reason. Okay, so this is me later after recording with Rebecca chiming in as I'm editing this episode. I thought I would occasionally do this because sometimes I want to clarify something I'm saying, and I want to clarify what I just said. I am being a little facetious or maybe a lot facetious in my description of Umberto and Bob. So let me be clear that I was talking with Stacy the other night about how there is this interesting spectrum of Berto who talks a lot, interrupts a lot, which is really great. And he is an excellent podcast host partially because of that reason. He always has something to say when I throw to him. He always has something interesting off the cuff. Now, is everything that comes out of our mouths interesting? No. And sometimes you'll hear boring bits or I'll cut it out, to be frank. And I do that a lot, actually, particularly me. (laughs) I'll, I'll be saying something. I'll be like, golly, it's just so boring. So there's that. But it is sometimes... Uh, of a negative, but I would say I would definitely take the good with the bad here with Berto in that sometimes it is a negative in that it's hard sometimes to have a back and forth with him on the podcast because I will talk for a while and then he will talk for a while and then I will talk. Whereas with, which which is fine, there's pros and cons to that, but with Rebecca, I talk for a little bit, she talks for a little bit, and then I'll say something, she'll say something. There's more of a conversation, which I appreciate. So anyway, I think there's pros and cons to every style, and I love podcasting with all three of my co-hosts. With Bob, I've, I'm pretty sure I've talked about this on the podcast. Uh, Bob and I have 
definitely talked about it off mic. And it's always cordial conversations. But I will tell Bob, or I'll have to continually remind him that he is here, you know, when he comes over to record with me, he's here to talk. <laughs> he is not here to listen to me talk. I tell him that my, what I'm shooting for is he is talking for 95% of the time and I'm talking for 5% of the time. And if when I tell him that, I can only manage to get him to say things 30% of the time. Um, I even got him this plaque, this engraved placard made out of wood and metal and everything. And it has this words. It's like, you're here, something like, uh, you're here to talk at least 51% of the time or something like that. And Because I wanted this visual reminder to him to, to say things. Because even when I would throw to Bob, whom I love, and of course I know you all love him too, uh, and he is an excellent podcaster, but it's like hard sometimes to get him to say things because he fall he you know he falls into the butler syndrome mode where he feels like he's here to support me com- without interjecting or offering anything so he he'll get into this mode and it'll get to the point where I'll throw to him I'll say so bob what do you think and he'll say oh um huh, I don't know if I have anything to say about that. And I'll often cut those bits out because it's so, I don't know, it just doesn't come across well. <laughs> it, it just sounds like deflating because with Berto and with Rebecca, they would always have at least something to say, even if it was brief, but it would be some sort of th- mini thesis or point or experience or story or so. And, you know, sometimes... Uh, I throw to uh, particularly Berto and he'll say something that isn't really related. (laughs) So sometimes you'll hear that or sometimes I'll edit that out. But with Bob, it's harder. And uh, of course, there's pros and cons there. The pro is that Bob is very caring and loving and not narcissistic and is very in service to people, is not overbearing or dominant or anything. And my other co-hosts are more like that, right? And again, pros and cons. So when I said that thing (laughs) in the episode where I'm like, uh, Rebecca is just right, Berto talks too much, and Bob never talks, I I just wanted to kind of clarify that, that I wouldn't have it any other way. I love it the way that it is. There are occasional frustrations that I have to deal with and it's fine and we talk about it and the end product and the experience for myself is 99% not only just positive but like near euphoric for me (laughs) it is a, a wonderful feeling to talk with all three of them for hours at a time just facing each other you know, we sit really close to each other typically. When when you see videos, I put them on the other side of my table, but when we podcast audio with no video, they're sitting within like I can I could sort of reach over and touch their knee, you know, if I wanted to. And so it's this very intimate conversation. There's no distractions and it just feels really good. And my dog is wanting to nose her way into my office and she hears me talking and is now going away. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so let's get back to the episode. I'll play the descending line. But also all of this codes me as a Jewish woman, right? Like I, my culture, women made a lot of the money because men were often studying Torah for huge amounts of hours. And so women were out in the community making money. And so they had to be loud and they had to be forceful and they had to keep their families fed. Right. So like, this is a cultural thing. And it, I was actually talking with um, E and their boyfriend about the episode about uh, trans bodies. Your kid E. People yeah. don't know. Okay. This, so. Yeah. My, my fantastic kid. Um, and we were talking about trans bodies and trans lives and, you know, being attractive and being desired and not desired. And um, 
E said, the thing that always fascinates me is how often people say they're annoyed by your voice in the YouTube comments. And then all three of us in really? the room. Really? I haven't even seen that. Oh, okay. Wow. All three of us in the room. This used to happen more in the beginning. I think people have learned, like, I'm not going to change the way I speak. If you don't like the way I speak, just don't listen to the episode. I'm yeah. always going to sound exactly the same. Yeah. So we were talking, all three of us in the room are Jewish. And, and all of us live in Jewish communities and spend lots of time with Jewish cis women. And so it is not, we are used to my type of voice, my cadence, my loudness, my intensity. And that if you've never hung in that space, mm-hmm. it is sh- like shocking. Like the first time you're in an all Jewish event and like everybody's arguing, talking over each other, you better be telling the funniest story or someone's going to interrupt and tell a funnier story. You know, like this is like the zeitgeist that kept these people going. And if you're just hearing this in cyberspace, you know, it's not how women in America are trained to talk. Mm -hmm. I don't up talk. Mm -hmm. Well, that's also apparently annoying to a lot of people for similar sexist reasons. Pretty much, I feel like with women as content audio providers, there's almost no voice that's that acceptable. they can have right. that will not piss off a certain group of people. So, and um, I'm trying to, uh, oh my God, Seinfeld, the only female character, Elaine, has a podcast now where she talks to older women about their experience. And it got, it got like the highest podcast award of the year. Mm. And it was just so, I was like, man, like that's. I was like, that's a huge shift in our culture that a conversation between two women um, talking about stuff that's, you know, uncomfortable, aging, mm. sexism. Well, she did that funny thing with T- Tina Fey and... Oh, right, about aging. Your, yeah. your date is over. You're, yeah. f- you're free now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, there there are more spaces for women's voices than ever before. And so I, I think people might be getting... <laughs> used to i think so i think it's it's getting better it's we're not there yet but no. it's getting better yeah if you haven't listened to that podcast people always ask me what's my favorite podcast and it's that one mm. where, where she's talking to older women uh would you say that chelsea is abusive i would say that chelsea is damaged and um but ha- the effect uh that to me is not abuse. That is a coping strategy that's not working very well. Because a lot of people will point to classic abusive behaviors. She didn't say these things, but she kind of did say these things. I don't want to be with a guy who leaves the house to Mm -hmm. be with any friends, even though I was invited, or at least I could have come. I don't want you to have friends. I don't like that friend. Mm -hmm. I am going to be angry and very emotionally harmful to you because you zipped out for an hour to appear at a birthday party. I'm going to accuse you. I'm going to limit you. I'm going to potentially pressure you to have sex because emotionally there will be consequences if Mm. you don't. I mean, he he brought that up. Mm -hmm. I don't know another category to put that in exactly yeah i mean uh, i guess this i'm gonna get in trouble for saying this um i mean uh, abuse means power over to me is this relationship ideal no um are these qualities that i would want in a partner that would be red flags for me that i would get out right away Yes. Um, If these dynamics were to continue, but the fact that he gets the fuck out. Mm -hmm. Right. There's, and I talk about this too, that there's a difference between abusive behavior and a person being abused. Like someone can come up to me on the street that I don't know, and they can start calling me a piece of shit. And I don't know what I'm talking about and I'm stupid. And that's abusive language, but I will probably won't feel abused because I won't take it personally because I don't know that this person, it's not going to get under my skin. I can walk away and you can be abusive in a relationship by 
trying to get someone to not have friends, even though that's not your goal. Your goal is you just want to reduce right, the pain that close, you're close. Right, you're trying to get close proximity. Yeah, yeah. But your overall method includes pressuring someone to not have friends because you know you could imagine Jimmy after that moment. Every time he thinks about reaching mm-hmm. out to his friends, text, calling, meeting up with briefly, you know he's going to flinch a little bit. Mm-hmm. But if he doesn't eventually kind of retract and become under her control over time, then it's abusive behavior, but he doesn't necessarily feel abused. Right. And you can see in his face his autonomy in those fights. You know, he still feels his own sense of personal power and says, like, I'm going to, I'm not, you know, I'm on the couch tonight. I'm not home tonight. Like, um, so there is a way in a truly, you know, it's a spectrum, right? But in abusive relationships, the abused partner has lost that sense of autonomy and has no personal power. Mm -hmm. This is obviously a huge spectrum you know, if you don't know what we're talking about, there's a wonderful resource out there called The Wheel of Power and Control mm. that talks about all of the ways that abuse can happen in a relationship. Um, is Chelsea and Jimmy's relationship good? No, it is not good. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that Chelsea's behavior should be called out and identified as abusive because regardless of gender, most people don't know what it actually looks like Uh or how it begins. That's how it begins. That's one of the ways. Also, most people can't fathom a woman being abusive. Women can be fucking abusive. (laughs) Take it from me. So uh, another question, was Chelsea and Trevor a better match? Should they have, should Chelsea have gone with mullet guy? (laughs) I mean, did, so the number one, well, I'm, I'm very curious. Did Trevor fuck his friends? Um, would Chelsea, so I think the question here is, would Chelsea have been less triggered by Trevor, mm-hmm. felt his love more? To, right, it's a good question. And I hadn't thought about that. I imagine Jimmy would be one of the least triggering people mm-hmm. among, uh, on, on the bell curve of dudes. Mm-hmm. I would say Jimmy is probably pretty untriggering. You know, right, and and she says, "Oh, Trevor is my type. That's the type that I go for." And I'm curious if that like kind of huge person at least sends a message to her that she is safe. There's something in there, right? Like, why do we have a type? You know, I mean, there are these like ways in in which we want or desire a certain look. It, you know, it it meets something in our psyche. Why is she looking for that man over and over again? Mm-hmm. Um, but you know who Chelsea needs to go to therapy before she partners. And she is. Oh, my contact told me, and she has come forward saying, yeah, Um, but I was thinking about, I think for the first time, actually. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, I was thinking about how many people had come through my therapy practice who came in because they were in relationships that just ended or were ending and they were just mortified by their partner choice and then eventually went on to find more appropriate partners. And it's really high. I think it's like 80% or something. That there is something that happens in therapy. Where, 80% of your clients? I think so. Like like anecdotally, that'll yeah. happen. Yeah. Would you say your success rate is similar? I can't really tally that and in you my did head. couples work too, which is, you've had twice as, and family work, you've had 400 times more clients than I have. But, and I see a lot of Chelsea's. I see a lot of highly emotional folks who cannot figure out why they're getting, they're not getting their, their needs met. Yeah. But something happens in therapy where you begin to reflect on yourself. You begin to get back into yourself in terms of what are your needs mm-hmm. versus what belongs to everybody else. Um, I think you can date more intentionally too. You know, you, you, instead of like reacting and trying to please you can, right, you start to assess sooner. But you can also be discern. more real, you know? Like, right, this is who I really like, am. Like in the beginning of dating, it's mm-hmm. like, well, normally I would be avoiding this, but let's get real, you know? Well, and there is that scene for some of the women who stop wearing all of the makeup with their men, and it's like, 
you know, you can see they're like, oh, I feel safe and I don't have to put on my armor to be with you. And they look radically different. Mm-hmm. Like on the show, are you saying? Yeah. That? Yeah. Who looked the most radically different? This principal and... Brittany. Brittany. There's something about the way that Brittany looks with without all the f- fake eyelashes and all of that, that I was like, wow. She's a pageant person. Oh, that makes a lot of sense then. Why she would look really, really different. Yeah. Final question. Ooh. Are you going to watch season seven? I got to make it through season six. <laughs> are you going to watch any? After, if if you manage to get know. through, are you going to watch any more? Well, I, you're in pain. So, it looks like you're, I know. Looks I like you're in pain. I have not had acid <laughs> reflex like that since I was pregnant. <laughs> like something happened in my welcome, body. Welcome to Love is Blind. <laughs> it was like visceral and like that didn't happen in ultimatum no because it was because i knew those people i knew that world it was something so much safer uh, for me i was so entertained and i was in love with most of them but there was a lot of trauma and pain and hurt god it hit me really differently i think for me the love is blind is the immersion in the straight world yeah you're swimming upstream yeah of. where i'm just like who that's when i texted you i was like who are these people <laughs> i mean i spend zero time with straight people in their late 20s early 30s mm-hmm. so like there was just a lot that i had no idea what was going on yeah um and then there's yeah, the piece, I th- but I think the piece that made me physically ill was the producer's manipulation of like, this situation isn't bad enough. Like, well, throw in van participant number two. So, manipulative, yes. But this is just my opinion, and maybe people say it's biased, but I have a, a limited experience with the landscape of reality TV because there's a lot out there. Mm-hmm. But I will say that the Love is Blind show in particular is one of the most seemingly dedicated to actually presenting the real story than a lot of other shows will. Now, do they edit? Yes. There's a lot of problems, but compared to the other shows that I've watched, like even 90 Day Fiance or other kinds of shows, I find Love is Blind to be refreshingly at least from my estimation, more real. And Love is Blind, the premise, just provides a reality that you don't have to manufacture because there are so many young people today that are so disillusioned with dating in the regular manner that they are willing to do this. And they clearly, a good number of them, come on the show like energy, because you know, they, they, they're recruited months in advance. Mm-hmm. So they're just like, I'm going, Love is Blind, I'm going. And they're telling all their friends, and it's building in their head, like my partner, potential love of my life is in a locked room. Yeah, and they're looking for the same thing, mm-hmm. and the intimacy and the sensory deprivation and the no phones and like the the stripping away of all the bullshit culture about how you're supposed to act and look, mm-hmm. like everything is just stripped down to just a human interaction that might not ever happen for anybody and they someone could go their whole life get married have kids and never have that amount of intimacy with somebody Mm -hmm. and it facilitates that realness and they get invested even people like clay if you believe him who was very skeptical going in like i don't imagine this will work but i guess we'll see it looked as though even for him he got swept up in the yeah, magic. Yeah, he tears down. I mean, that is a man who's probably not cried much. He was sobbing about the gender roles that he has given himself. Yeah. Saying things that, according to Clay, and I believe him, I think, that he's never realized or thought mm-hmm. about or had a person that he could. And he's doing, and they're doing it on camera, too. Mm-hmm. When I sat down to watch that during the pe- beginning of the pandemic, like when lockdown had just happened, and I was like, huh, this is actually kind of watchable. <laughs> I, I thought, well, maybe I was wrong about reality TV. And I, I was to some extent, but also I didn't realize, because once I started watching other reality TV, just how well-made Love is Blind is compared to the landscape. 
And even like the set is unreal. Mm. Like, do they fly them into LA to live in this weird pod world? Is it just sitting there all the time, or do they build the pod world? They build the pod world in a warehouse, a gigantic, mm. humongous. So you know, you see all the the hallways mm-hmm. and the pods. Outside of that the- is this massive complex of cameras and and TV screens mm-hmm. and hundreds of. Uh, producers because again everyone is listening to there's all there's someone listening to every right. single yeah. lapel mic for the entire day there's all these handlers food people water people crap because they have to feed not only the cast but they have right. to feed hundreds of workers there's bathroom you know they have to escort people to the bathroom because mm-hmm. you can get lost in mm. the because you have to walk outside the pods mm-hmm. in, to go to the bathroom they have. I would be horrible at this show because I have to pee every hour. This is not. <laughs> I would not do well. They have drivers. You'll notice they don't do Love Is Blind for old people because there'd be so much time going oh, back and forth through the bathroom. That, that was my question. Was well, they could just do pods and with bathrooms attached. There'd just be a toilet right there, like a prison. <laughs> but like how? So Stacy and I were going over this. We're like, yeah. Okay, they have Queer Love Ultimatum, hmm. but they've got to have Love Is Blind queer queer how would you do it i mean it's gonna be hard to find 30 people who don't know each other in the you can't do it in the same town but also there's no one side and another side right yeah i mean i i i mean would you do tops and bottoms i don't know that's what i said to stacy yeah not well i i said mask femme because you know that's a thing but you know a lot of people don't follow that yeah, and it would be really intense because presentation is so big in the queer community. I wonder if people could really surrender. And like uh, the whole thing that we had about the, we were talking about Bear Weekends and the last time we met. Like, I'm so curious if someone would step outside of their, you know, crush type. Um, but and that's the whole premise of right, Love is Blind. Right, I know. Is that if you're having trouble finding love, maybe you need to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I would be fascinated. It would be hard. especially. But the, small, but the part of it is it would be hard because those communities are so small. You're not going to find 30 people who well, don't know each other. But let's say you did. Let's say you town. find 30 people who don't know each other. And who do you recruit? Do you recruit... Uh, uh, similar people who were on Queer Love, or d- do we uh, gay guys? What about Polly? Like, what's go- what's going on? Yeah, I it, it well as with everything with gay culture, you just split open the paradigm, and it doesn't work as well. <laughs> like, does Ultimatum usually just have five couples? Yes. Okay, so I think going or small. I think six. Okay, five or six. Yeah. I mean, smallness helps. I still haven't watched Couple to Thruple. I need to get in on that. So, because the, the the method that I came up with on the fly was that you have 16. Because as a cishet guy, you're dating 15 women. Mm-hmm. And choosing one to continue with through the pods. So, if you have 16 people who can all date each other, each person has 15 people to choose mm-hmm. from. It's going to get, but then like, are they staying? But then the dynamic of like staying in separate dorms isn't going to work. They couldn't, they couldn't see each other in the lounge. Right. So what I came up with, because (laughs) a lot of the drama happens outside of the pods during the pods, because there are these conversations. So I, what I came up with is each person brings three of their buddies. Ooh, and gossips. And so you go into the pod and you date. You know, and you, it is the same as what we see. But I mind. wonder if there would be less connections that way because you'd talk to your friends and your friends would talk you out of stuff. <laughs> um, so I maybe maybe what you do is you have four different groups of sixteen, and your friends are other, no, because then you might fall in love with people that. What you, if you start hooking up with your friends while you're on the show and you're supposed to be right? Yeah. I mean, I think you'd have to do it like... And maybe I think maybe they, family members. You could bring like your, your yeah. parents and cousins or something. Oh, this would be a mess. But I think there are some shows that are like date daddy, you know, like young gay men looking for older gay men. Um, so you could do it like that. So 15 older gay guys, yeah. 15 younger. Yeah. Okay. Or you could do 
bottoms and tops. So you'd have to identify, identify yourself as like... And there's plenty, plenty, plenty. Okay. And there's a top shortage. Do you know this joke? I think you've told me yes. before. Oh, I don't know if you told me the joke. Well, it's just a perception that there's a top shortage. So the bottoms would be dying to go on the show if they were guaranteed. What's the joke? I mean, there's never enough tops. There's never enough butches. There's never enough tops. There's never enough masks. Yeah. There's always these kind of shortages. In fact, it was this is one of the things that came up in the couples weekend was this like longing for more queer community in, and I was I typed in something really snarky in the chat of like yeah song is old as time right this idea that like because of whatever aspect of i am i'm not getting like to the big queer community i'm not getting enough queerness in my life um you know there's this kind of longing in queer culture that watching love is blind i'm like they get to heterosexual all day long every day there's so much heterosexualness going on yeah like it's just kind of amazing to me because I haven't lived in that world in decades. Mm -hmm. So I'd be very interested to watch how they would do it. I think not being able to do it and they'd have to do like Los Angeles or New York. I'm trying to think of where or maybe I mean Seattle has the largest lesbian community per capita in the nation, but we don't do shit like this. <laughs> like you're not putting me in a pod. So maybe LA, but those who have all those LA. But I can also see it being hard because of the discarding, and rightfully so, of the the cishet paradigm. And, right. And I want to get being. I'm trying to think of and any a, being a, much more okay with polyamory, right? Or I'm trying to think of any queer person. I can think of one out of hundreds of gay people that I know who are like who would say getting married and being partnered is the most important thing in my life. And then it's all I want to work towards right now. That's having, not a common. Yeah. Having said that on ultimatum queer love for those folks, maybe by selection bias because of what the show is recruiting. Right. That's the, they were very invested in that paradigm, you know? Yeah. So maybe you just have to find, because there's also a lot of het people who are not, into getting married, particularly at that moment, you know what I mean? Because to to me and Stacy, for years now, ever since we started watching Love Is Blind, we're like, well, they can't just have het people every time. <laughs> like, there's got to be You'd a be variation how many on this. Heterosexual people there are. There. I know, but <laughs> it, the fact that they did queer love because it's kinetic that makes right. queer love. Yeah, and so they have that motivation at the very least for marketing. I mean, queer love was one of the most popular reality shows of all time. It's the most popular podcast we've ever done. <laughs> and so they, even just for money's sake, but also I think rightfully so, and if you're trying to make variations to the story, you've got to do it. So, but but how I think is the in question. the research, yeah. Or like, you know what? I'd be willing to contract with them to discuss this further if they want to talk to me. I got to go. Yeah. And everyone, please take care of yourself, truly because you're worth it and spring is here go out and enjoy something out there